monitoring, it's also about taking actions on the data that you're gathering from the Azure deployments. Uh, then we also would give you the ability to have alerts and notifications based on all of this data and our real-time analytics on top of it. So at all times, you have a constant stream of data flowing into our system. We're performing this analytics with a uh, minute or less latency and then giving our customers alerts and uh, notifications that something's going wrong or something's going outside the bounds that they expect. Additionally, we would use this same analytical framework to, base, to take actions, such as restarting machines, rebooting machines, doing DNS failovers, in addition to scaling their services based on this information. And by doing this, we're able to give them a very tight relationship between the capacity that they need and the capacity that they're actually paying for. And to give a quick demo of what uh, your dashboard would look like with something like Metrics Hub, just to again provide some context, you can see here uh, on the upper left we have the application health for our customer, and then in the center we also have how much they're spending. And as you navigate through the site, we're able to break this all down in real time associated with metadata that we collect and that our customers have defined to let you know how much different pieces like your test environment versus your production environment are costing you and what the health looks like uh, for each of those respective environments. Uh, another key component here is, uh, is a scaling interface, which basically helps our customers uh, get an idea, you can see in the bottom right, basically what the capacity is that they're paying for versus the capacity that they actually need. And we do this by analyzing several different data sources across our entire customer's deployments uh, and giving them basically real-time understanding of what their capacity requirements are. And what this helps our customers do is get back that money underneath the curve so that they're only paying for what they need uh, in the public cloud. Uh, and just also, so for Metrics Hub, which was using uh, Cassandra for our entire data ingestion and data computation analytics, uh, we had very rapid customer growth. Basically, we went from nothing to over 2,000 enterprise customers in less than six months. Also, uh, <clears throat> which you can see here, kind of the, the typical good graph that you like to see of up and to the right. And with each new customer that we got, it meant more data sources, more information flowing into our system that we had to ingest and process inside of Cassandra. And every single uh, data point here is another virtual machine, which means more data to collect. And every single customer means another subscription or AWS account that we have to monitor the spending for, uh, and so on. Everything results in more and more data coming into our system. And this entire time, even though we're uh, kind of growing these data sources to very large levels, we only had three people at the company. And that was to do both engineering development, engineering operations, and our business side. And the reason that we were able to have such a large data infrastructure so easily was because Cassandra was so easy to manage and operate for us in our back end. Uh, and this is kind of what we're talking about here is the data that we're seeing is over 200 million per hour. I think it's actually over 300 million per hour now. And this is just constantly increasing as more and more customers come, up, come on and sign on board with Metrics Hub. Uh, and we can see here what that looks like for each data source for us. Every single VM is 1,000 new data points per minute. 1,000 VMs, that's a million data points per minute. And uh, similarly, we have endpoints and uh, URLs and platform services accounts, all information that is flowing into our system that we have to collect, uh, aggregate, and process in real time so that we can actually enable our customers to do those alerts, notifications, and actions in a way that are meaningful for them. When we first started, uh, we looked at Redis as a potential solution for us. What we were thinking is that we could do in-memory aggregation using the complex operations that Redis supports so that we can increment or add sets and so on in memory uh, for all hot, our hot data as it flows in. Then we could turn around and flush this aggregate data to a more persistent store, like maybe SQL or, some, or a NoSQL store, uh, and actually use that for our visualization and for our analytics. Uh, the problem with, with this, even though Redis is so fast, powerful, and has a great open source community, is that it ends up being very fragile and expensive. Having this system where we're aggregating data in memory then flushing requires complex coordination across many machines, uh, which we didn't want to sign up to do. It also requires us to constantly be supporting this flushing, otherwise we just can't take any more data because we will run out of memory. And, and another important component, since our entire application runs in the public cloud, uh, no matter what your public cloud is, is that memory is much cheaper than storage. Storage is basically free, a cents a gig. You can use terabytes and terabytes with no concern for cost, really. But as you start uh, using gigs and gigs of memory, your costs are adding up very quickly. 
Another thing that we considered was to use SQL to aggregate this data. In this case, what we'd do is we'd have tables associated with different granularities or different metadata, metadata types. We could constantly be rolling over, and then we could drop those tables basically as it falls out of view. So drop minute granularity after a week if we no longer need it. Uh, this also would give us a lot more complex capabilities in that we can do updates, max uh, updates for counters, max min, other operations in an atomic way, which means we can do a lot of uh, great aggregation on write instead of having to have jobs that run later and actually generate the aggregate view. <clears throat> Problem with, with uh, us in our case is our write input is much, much larger than our read input. And as our customer base were, was growing, if we end up with just a few dozen customers, already we have to start doing complex sharding to, base, uh, to enable our customers to uh, basically support the right input. Additionally, when we have some customers that are particularly large and represent a sizable percentage of our virtual machine count, partitioning their data across multiple machines or multiple SQL servers, because it can't all fit on a single server, became very problem problematic. Uh, but nonetheless, it is possible, just like it is with Redis, but it just wasn't the wor worth the operational cost for us to do as a small company that was growing. So we ended up at Cassandra. I uh, never went back. So the reason is we were able to scale fluidly. We started at one node, went to two nodes, four nodes, eight nodes, 16 nodes, 32 nodes, as our customer base grew. We were able to do all of this completely online upgrades and online increases in capacity without having to do any management ourselves. And this is what was alluring versus other alternatives that we had uh, examined. Addi additionally, it, it's just very highly scalable. Uh, at the end of the day, Metrics Hub was an application that required large data ingestion and processing. And the easiest way to get that with something off the shelf was with Cassandra. And our time series workloads just matched it perfectly. And when it comes to operation uh, and ramp up time, we were able to get a node set up running in the public cloud uh, in just really minutes. And then we also were able to go and scale that continuously and support that without having to do large commitments in terms of human resource or time. And this was a big plus for us, again, because uh, you kind of run short on time as you're growing like that. Uh, and then a key component that we did is that all of our aggregation happens on write without any jobs to go back and actually, uh, say, roll up under a particular metadata tag or a particular time granularity. And the benefit of this is we always have real-time views at any, uh, any resolution for our customers or associated with any of our pre-canned uh, aggregate filters without having to have any jobs run. Because if you have jobs running, it means more support effort, more things that can break, and also more likelihood that your customers are going to see old or stale data we're going to be taking automatic actions or alerts based on data that just is not accurate. And something that works out very well for us in our case was that uh, the cogs of Cassandra and Azure are very good. You can run a 32-node cluster where each node has eight cores for a very reasonable price. Uh, and again, the, the storage is just eight cents a gig, so uh, it doesn't really add up in terms of a bill. And Ricardo will go into a lot more detail about how our architecture actually works. All right, so let's talk about the architecture. By the way, my team inside Microsoft works with partners worldwide, moving applications to Windows Azure. So we identify patterns and in in, in, um, approaches that work in the cloud. And we believe that the architecture being used for Metrics Hub is a good uh, illustration of what other partners are doing, uh, combining different components inside the platform. So uh, we are actually using uh, framework or an application running on Azure to monitor other applications running on Azure at the same time. Um, this is the, the general uh, architecture. Uh, on, the, on your left-hand side, you're going to see all the clients. And actually, you will notice that two of those components are actual virtual machines running on Azure. You have the pass uh, machines, the platform service machines running. You have the virtual machines. And obviously, we have the web browsers uh, talking to the platform for um, uh, administration purposes. So those are the three types of clients that we identify for Metrics Hub. And then uh, in the middle, you're going to have all the logic running on pass. And we're gonna, uh, I'm going to mention the benefits of running on pass and what we're doing those specific components on, on, on pass. Um, we have the jobs worker role, the web API, and the portal. Then the Cassandra cluster is running on infrastructure as a service. Those are the virtual machines that we recently GA'd um, uh, back in April. They've been in preview for the last almost 12 months. Um, and what we believe is the combination of these deployment models, PaaS plus IIS, plus other services. Because in this case, Metrics Hub is, is taking advantage of the Azure storage. We have tables, which is basically our 
key value approach to NoSQL. We have blobs to store files, large files. And then we also have a SQL database that, correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, but we're using for authentication purposes, right? So we're using SQL to store all the membership information that we're using for authentication inside Metrics Hub. So this is the general architecture. I'm going to take a deeper dive into the pass component because um, it's, when we talk to partners and when we talk to companies, it's difficult for them to understand when to use PaaS, when to use virtual machines, when to use services. And to be honest, that's probably the number one um, problem that cloud architects face, is which deployment model should I use for this specific component? And um, at the end of the day, what you're going to find is that depending on what, and which one you choose, you're going to spend more time maintaining the machines, or you're going to spend more time uh, worrying about the application and the data of your solution. So taking a deeper dive into, uh, into PaaS, um, PaaS is based on stateless machines, meaning that you can scale a lot faster if, uh, if you want to add more um, instances because your traffic change or your demand change based on, I don't know, uh, CNN mentioned your company this morning and you need to increase the number of instances for your portal. You can do it easily with PaaS. It's not that simple with virtual machines or IIS because then you, need, you, you, you can run some scripts, but you can still need to use an image and uh, provision more computers. With PaaS, it's just one HTTP request and you have more or less machines running on, on that platform. So um, the other thing is that you don't have to worry about the human operational cost. Even, even though you can automate some of the virtual machine uh, provisioning, it's not as easy as doing that with PaaS, as I mentioned already. Um, we have a couple of uh, what we call roles, but uh, it's a lot easier to understand this if you think of images already created in the cloud. And the web role is a Windows server with IIS installed, pre-installed for you. A working role is, is a Windows server without IIS. That's it. That's the only difference between the two of them. Um, for most of the components that I show you running on PaaS, we're using web roles. And we have one for the job scheduler using a worker role. Um, one important thing is that you have to make sure that your architecture is ready to support stateless machines, meaning that you're going to externalize your data to somewhere else. In this case, we're externalizing to Cassandra, and we're externalizing to other storage services like Azure Storage and SQL Azure. Okay. So this is the jobs worker role. Um, this one takes care of the recurring task. It's based on Azure tables and queues as well, messaging. So this is using services that are already provisioned for us. We don't have to worry about provisioning machines for these services. They're already just up and running. We create a, a, an endpoint or a connection, and we start using that for the, for the jobs worker role. If I'm not mistaken, this is running, um, uh, it's using .NET too, right? Um, it's, it's using just .NET. In there, it, it also manages some of the round robin for the Cassandra cluster. Um, Charles is going to take a deep dive into that Cassandra cluster, but it takes care of some of those um, responsibilities in the architecture. Then you have the Web API, and this is the gateway to the architecture. You, I mean, I'm sure that you're familiar with, with, with API roles. Um, it's not only for the virtual machines to communicate with Cassandra and actually send information. So in this case, the virtual machines are pushing the monitoring information into the, the Metrics Hub um, uh, application, uh, but also is the gateway for other services. So for example, uh, for the Windows Azure store, if, if you go to the Windows Azure portal and you want to add Metrics Hub to your deployment, you can do it directly from there, and all the communication happens through this role. And this is running on uh, the, the .NET Web API, um, ASP.NET, using a web role with IIS. And then the next one is just the portal web role, which is an, an ASP.NET with MVC uh, running. Very, very simple. Um, sorry, yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, um, so yeah, this is an ASP.NET MVC. But uh, what many other companies are doing is they are using PHP or Ruby on Rails or whatever they prefer to deploy their web applications. So just notice that um, just a few of those machines are using Windows, which is the PaaS. And um, most companies decide to use PaaS not because of Windows or Linux or any other operating system. They decide to use PaaS because they don't have to spend time uh, maintaining those computers. We are, when you're running on PaaS, uh, we take care of the security updates. We take care of uh, all the new 
um, patches if they need to be applied to Windows. And we actually have the concept of upgrade domains and fail domains. So you can assign your instances to different groups and they are updated or they are uh, secure in different, um, in different time frames. So you don't have to worry about your customers or your uh, users uh, seeing downtimes for your application. Um, anything else, Charles, that I'm missing? Uh, no, I just say the, the main component of the PaaS is basically you can combine the Azure PaaS with the Azure IaaS offering. So you can have a mixture basically of flexibility of deploying like Heroku, but at the same time the power of a virtual machine like you may see in AWS. So you can get both of those under one roof in a secure network and operating together with a common platform service. Right, and we'll talk about virtual networks in a bit, but um, one of the big differentiators for, for Azure today is that we're promoting the combination of PaaS and IaaS uh, with secure and internal endpoints. So in this case, in the current architecture that we have, we're using external endpoints. But, uh, but now that we have virtual networks in place, we can actually connect PaaS and IIS with internal endpoints. So I'll turn it over to Charles so he can talk about the Cassandra cluster in the architecture. Uh, so our Cassandra cluster maintains all of the state for all metrics and time series data we collect for all of our customers in a single large cluster, which today is 32 extra large nodes, which is 256 cores. Uh, this cluster also stores terabytes of data and is the only uh, single, I say the only stateful component that we operate with entire, within the entire metrics hub service, which helps us keep it simple in terms of deployment and maintenance. Additionally, for communicating with uh, this cluster, we use a, a library called Fluent Cassandra. It's a C-sharp library that supports a lot of the same syntax you'll see in, say, Java or other uh, common libraries for Cassandra, which means you can either execute CQL queries directly, which is what we do for all of our work, or you can even have the, the thrift-style uh, communication as well. And the way that we collect or create our virtual machines is using the standard interfaces within Windows Azure, which is the management portal or the PowerShell, or the command line interfaces, which support both Linux and uh, OS X. Uh, or, and the way all of this works is basically there are REST APIs that expose all functionalities you'd expect from the platform. Uh, you, the image we use for our particular Cassandra cluster actually is Ubuntu. Um, you can have either Windows or any other Linux variant that you want. Um, there are several pre-canned images, and you can also upload images yourself that you want to, to have for your virtual machines. Uh, and these, these images can either, uh, will run off of a network attached disk. There is ephemeral storage available to you, um, but something I'll talk about in a little bit, but you can use a network back disk as well for your data storage, which simplifies a lot of your disaster recovery stories without having to do any additional code or configuration yourself. In our case, uh, for our 32 nodes, we break it out into eight pods, each of which are four nodes. And the reason we do this is because each pod maps to a concept called a failure domain or an upgrade domain in Azure. And what a failure domain is analogous to for AWS, just to give context, it would be an availability zone. It'll be on different hardware, on a different side of the data center or in a separate data center in the same region, which uh, ensures that if we have a hardware fail failure in that particular data center, that machines in a separate pod would not be impacted. Uh, additionally, each one of these pods guarantees that uh, with our replication factor equal to three, that data is only is in three distinct pods as well, which is something that we configure uh, manually. And this, this is how we ensure that we basically have high availability across hardware failure, data center failure, or uh, network failure. And each one of these pods are exposed outside uh, to the rest of our components via an endpoint. So there's one endpoint per pod. Uh, where all of them sit behind a single uh, FQDN but on different ports. Uh, and these endpoints are, are lo load balancing between the four machines in each pod. And the reason that we do this is because each pod uh, is exposed as a separate endpoint to our clients, and our clients go round robin between these different endpoints and can blacklist or whitelist or demote or add different weight to each of these endpoints based on the performance it's seen in real time. And the benefit of this is that if a particular set of machines are performing poorly, it'll get blacklisted and our clients will no longer query that machine. Because something in our architecture is we have no caching layer in front of Cassandra. All reads and writes go directly to that cluster. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they're responding within appropriate latencies so that our website stays very fluid and interactive for our customers. One of the benefits that uh, you can find in Azure that Metrics Hub is taking advantage of is that load balancer. That load balancer is implicit 
anytime you deploy to any of those spots. Actually, we call those spots cloud services. So when you deploy a virtual machine to Windows Azure, a traditional uh, VHD in, in this case because uh, it's based on Hyper-V, um, you're going to get that load balancing in front of your machines. And you can decide if you want to do round robin or you can use a stuff forward. In this case, for the metrics of deployment, we're using a load balance endpoint that automatically goes around those four instances in each one of those spots. Uh, and for each one of these machines in the pod, we actually use eight uh, network back disks, and we write our data files directly to these. Uh, and the benefit of this is each one of these data disks are on our storage accounts that Azure manages, just like they would any other data file you put up there. Uh, and they're geo-replicated. So there are three copies in the, that particular region. So in US East, there are three copies uh, guaranteed to be in hardware there with every single commit. And then there's one uh, remote, geographically remote copy, which may be, say, US West or US Central or uh, in Europe, that will also have a copy of your data. And in our case, since Cassandra's append-only workload and the latency is so good for these storage accounts, we're able to run our entire cluster right off these network back disks, which greatly simplifies our operational lives. We don't have to worry about snapshotting to, from ephemeral to network disk or anything like that. Additionally, in our case, for our customers, our enterprise customers, it was an important ability to have a DR story, even from day zero. And by writing to these network disks, we could tell them that if US East is gone, we can fail over to US West within 24 hours uh, and other stuff like that, all because we can basically remount these particular VHDs in a different data center on a different virtual machine if we need to, or there's a prolonged outage on a particular region. And also, one other note that I found very interesting about our cluster is that for our virtual machines, they actually ended up generally being CPU bound instead of uh, I.O. bound. And that's mainly because we're able to uh, see that good performance on the network back disks. So um, Metrics Hub is taking advantage of another feature in Azure, which is in Windows, in Windows Azure storage, when you are defining your, um, your account, your storage account, you can enable geo-replication, automatically geo-replication. So we're going to copy all your data automatically to a secondary data center. In case there's a, a disaster in the data center, we have a backup of your data automatically there. And the cost is like three cents more per gigabyte per month. So it's definitely worth it. Uh, we recently, uh, recently back in December, we uh, upgraded the storage infrastructure. And now we're using uh, what we call a flat network storage. Uh, we use SSDs for uh, journaling inside. We have a 10 gigabit uh, network uh, internally. And uh, all the virtual machines are based on this storage infrastructure. And that's what is so reliable. And along those lines as well, since it's just the normal Azure storage that you use for any other blob, say like videos or photos, there's all this tooling out there to say download that VHD and stand up in a virtual machine in your own network as well. Uh, so that makes all of those processes very easy. In terms of how we store the data, uh, we have a very simple uh, schema. And we use this for all of our column families. We have the row key, in this case, which is text. And basically, is an encoded representation of a tenant ID and a metric name. And since we have this as the, arc, uh, as the first uh, component in the primary key, a single tenant actually gets to be partitioned against several machines within our cluster. So our larger customers who may say have 1,000 virtual machines, all the load generated from their entire deployments can be spread out over the cluster, which is very important for our larger customers and tenants. The CK contains the timestamp first, so that we have sorted by timestamps, a fairly standard model, uh, and also has metadata fields associated with that particular data point. So as an example, the, the, the RK may have a tenant ID and CPU, and the CK could have a timestamp and then a process name or a machine name or a region name, whatever particular metadata tags we've extracted for that particular data point. Uh, and all of this data is written using the, the distributed counters that uh, Cassandra affords out of the box, such that all of our aggregates uh, and views are in real time. So we just increment these counter values based on the samples uh, and as appropriate, um, so that we're always able to see for the one minute view of machines in US West, what's the CPU, or the one day view for machines, network latency, uh, by, say, US East. All of that data is immediately available at whatever granularity you want. So you can roll it into reports that are either very short and very hot in terms of very recent, or across longer reports if I wanted to, say, view the trends of how CPU today compares against the average CPU over the past 14 days. And all of this is very performant. We're talking uh, tens of milliseconds to basically fetch this data back. It's under 100 data points. Uh, and it's a single round trip to the Cassandra cluster to, to collect this information. 
And here uh, you can see basically how we're incrementing the sum by the sample value and the count. We we'll also have the ability to basically collapse this before we update it to Cassandra, uh, which is some optimizations we have to decrease our write load. And in that case, we may increment by several sample values summed together and count by more than one. Um, one other quick note kind of to drive it home, we have different column families for each granularity that we want to support. So we have a one minute column family, 10 minute column family, 15 second column family, one day column family, all of that, and we push the same updates to all of those column families at the same time in a giant batch operation, uh, which completes pretty quickly, and this is why we're able to see all those different granularities at the same time. And when we want to actually read these values back, we're able to make a single round trip to the database. Um, I know there are a few different ways to storm time, store time series data in Cassandra. We went this particular attack because we, our primary scenario is we want to look at a, a metric and its metadata over a period of time say a week or a month or 24, hour, or 24 hours, stuff like that, so that our customers are able to quickly fetch this data with one, one round trip, quick seek, scan, return, uh, which is highly performant for us and uh, basically allows us to serve this huge number of writes every day and then a huge number of reads because we have whatever, thousands of customers logged into our dashboard, which is updating in real time every 60 seconds. So there's also a sizable reload on top of that. Um, so that works well together. And in terms of what's next for us in, with integrating with the Azure platform services available, as, uh, as Ricardo mentioned earlier, there's a concept of virtual networks, which is what allows you to basically put your PaaS and IaaS components behind a, 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 a hidden network. Um, and you can also partition environments as well, so you can have, say, a virtual network for production, virtual network for test, virtual network for uh, development, and, and so on, so that these machines are able, only able to communicate with one another in a secure fashion. The other big thing that we want to do uh, is basically ex expand our Cassandra cluster to, to be across different uh, regions. So we have uh, fault domains, which is very easy to do in Azure, um, to have your Cassandra cluster span that. It's a little more complicated to have it actually go and span across regions, which is a, it's a, something you always see in the public cloud. Additionally, we want to basically continue to move components of our uh, application off of our homegrown com uh, capabilities, instead move the platform service as much as possible. Uh, all told, Metrics Hub has something like 30 open source uh, components uh, used in it and over 15 third-party uh, SaaS offerings as well. Uh, and that is part of our big focus, basically, to build as little as possible that's not essential to our business. So whenever we could take something and pay for it, whether it be from Microsoft or a partner via their store or any other REST SaaS offering out there, we would take that um, so we could basically move as fast as possible. Um, I wanna, I wanna, we want to show you a quick overview of where, where the Windows Azure platform is today. It has changed tremendously over the last 12 months. And um, one of the big benefits, as we mentioned earlier, is the combination of PaaS plus IES plus virtual networks. But everything starts with the infrastructure. We actually run the Windows Azure servers on the same data center where we have other services like Xbox Live, and Outlook.com. Right now we have eight of those data centers enabled with Windows Azure, four in the United States, two in Asia, and two in, in Europe. And we just announced that we're gonna open two more data centers in Japan, and two more data centers in Australia, and also um, a, um, one in, in, in uh, China, the mainland. So uh, the infrastructure keeps growing. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the infrastructure, you can go to globalfoundationservices.com which is the division inside Microsoft taking care of all this infrastructure. Um, and then on top of this, we have what we call the three pillars of Windows Azure. We have compute, and we have what we call cloud services. Cloud services is our PaaS machines, the ones where you only deploy a little package that you create um, with different IDEs. Obviously, we support Visual Studio, but we have support for IDEs like Eclipse for Java. And since everything is based on HTTP REST, uh, you can run macros on other IDEs to deploy to Windows Azure. And actually, uh, uh, we, we have companies using uh, uh, frameworks like Chef and other, and other uh, continuous integration uh, environments to deploy to Windows Azure. Uh, we also have the virtual machines, which is the infrastructure service where Cassandra is running. But the important thing is how you can combine these different deployment models using virtual networks. And that's the other pillar that we have on the right-hand side. You can combine different deployment models. You can connect to machines running on-premises. Um, 
you can actually have your Cassandra cluster running on premises. That's the, the other model that we have seen because of sovereignty issues or whatever the problem might be, security, you can connect via secure tunnel to on-premises uh, resources and connect these different deployment models. And we also have storage, where they talk about storage, the NoSQL approach for table storage, and blobs. And then on top of this, we have a REST API. Every single service is, 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 is REST enabled. And this is why you can connect from multiple platforms to these different components. You can um, either use compute or storage or virtual networks independently, or you can combine them. And that's why we consider our platform open, because it's all based on a RESTful interface. Obviously, we have SDKs that talk to that REST API. So if you are a Java programmer or a Ruby on REST programmer or a Node.js programmer, you can run on Azure, because so those SDKs take advantage of that uh, layer, that REST API layer to talk to the different components. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the platform keeps evolving. Uh, we just announced that uh, now we're going to start billing by the minute, not the hour. So you can have your machines running for five minutes, and we're going to only charge you for those five minutes you have your computer running. So the models are really interesting when it comes to economics in the cloud. And um, we keep enhancing the platform. Any, any other comments? Uh, uh, no, no other comments, just that if anyone has any questions, they feel free to ask now, or if you want to follow up with either one of us offline, we can kind of talk to you about running Linux or Cassandra in the Azure cloud or anything else like that. Yeah, the, we know that um, we had 50 minutes, so we wanted to leave between 10 and 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so we're gonna, we, we have the next 50 minutes for questions. Um, let me hand you over the... Any questions? No questions. <laughs> cool. Okay. Hi. Yeah. It's it's not so much a Cassandra question, but more a uh, um, you know Microsoft uh, IS you know, question. <laughs> um, so I understand the uh, the backing up to to other data sites for uh, disaster recovery type stuff. But um, are there point in time snapshots that you can take of your data in case of, you know, you want to protect yourself from corruption and stuff like that? Like a point in time snapshot of your, like, VHD or something like yeah. that? So, yeah. so the question is, let me answer here. So the question is if you can create snapshots of the VHDs or the virtual machines? Yes, you can. Uh, if you remember, all the virtual machines are based on regular Azure storage and blobs. So once you upload your blob, you can see it. I mean, it's something that you will see in your storage account. You can take a snapshot of that blob and um, do whatever you want with it. Uh, the other thing that we can do, that you can do with those, is you can take a snapshot of your VHD and create an image based on that specific state where your virtual machine is, and then use that image to create all their virtual machines from that point forward. Anybody Any else have questions? questions? Yes, here. Um, when you mentioned about inserting information into the state. So you mentioned that you're, uh, you're doing inserts in specific column families for each uh, granularity. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that, looks like, that sounds like a good idea for, uh, as a data model. Uh, have you considered any way to optimize that? In terms of uh, having different column families, or yeah, in terms of uh, um, either uh, decreasing the number of mutations uh, going into the system, or uh, you know being able to possibly compress the amount of uh, sort of redundant information in your system. Uh, so in our case, we kept this separate mainly for reten to simplify retention. So like for one minute, we'd only keep say for 24 hours, and we'd basically as more as uh, 24 hours elapsed, it'd fall off the one minute column family. So, and then for, say, the one-day granularity at last So these are all months. TTL columns? So we can't TTL, because you can't have a counter in TTL. Um, so basically, there are patches out there that you can get to basically drop. Basically, on compaction, you can drop data. Um, is how is, You have to get a patch to do it, though. It doesn't support natively. But uh, on compaction, we basically drop data that's older than a certain amount in each column family. So uh, I mean, uh, because that's an intriguing mm -hmm. way to store information for me, I, I, it would be interesting to just hear if, if you guys have come up with uh, even better ways to, to perform that. Yeah, so um, the main thing is you don't want to have, 
since you can't do TTLs for counters, um, you don't want to have to delete them manually, like because then you get end up with so much garbage and your compaction ends up taking a long time. Uh, so uh, I think it, it's a patch actually from Twitter you can take that will help you in this particular case of dropping data during compaction. So basically drop it without the tombstone ever existing. Yes, exactly. So that way it doesn't even look like a, technically we've never run a delete on our, cl on our cluster ever. Um, it's the data just disappears during compaction. So because right. otherwise it'll destroy, like compaction will really destroy your machines basically over time. That's pretty awesome. I'd mm -hmm. like to get my hands on that patch. Yeah. All right, thanks. Any other questions? One observation that I would like to make that, um, that I forgot to mention during the presentation is when we are monitoring the past machines, the ones running on the cloud services on Azure, we're taking advantage of the diagnostics framework. So actually, the diagnostics framework can uh, uh, we, we can pull data redirect, directly from there. So the job scheduler is just pulling information from the diagnostic. We don't have to install any agents on the Windows Path machines to get that information. For virtual machines, it's a little bit different. We have to install an agent on the virtual machines in order to, for, for those agents to push the data into the Cassandra cluster. So that's the other benefit of running uh, the, the uh, or, or monitoring the, the past machines is that we don't have to modify those at all. And we just pull the information from the, from the diagnostics framework. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank uh, you very much. For coming. Thanks. Feel free to grab us if you have a question offline.